Okay, so I am recording now. We are recording in process there. And again, I want to thank everyone for joining us for today's uh, webinar on the Brooks, the Ward 3 short-term family uh, housing facility. Um, I'm going to maybe ask John Michelle if you want to say a few words to start, and then we'll turn it over to Catherine to talk about the work that's going on. So, Jean Michel, I'll I will start with you if you'd like to say yes. to everybody. Yes. Thank you, Chris, and good afternoon, everybody. It's great to have you all online with us today. Looking forward to this uh, conversation about the Brooks, this wonderful short-term housing facility for families where up to 50 families can come to rebuild their lives, parents and children, and so that uh, we can find solutions to their homelessness uh, in a period of about three months, for those of you who don't know. Um, we're delighted to have been selected by the city and our partner, of course, is the Department of Human Services uh, in this uh, to run the groups. Um, Friendship Place has been serving in the ward now for 29 years and we felt uh, very strongly that we would be a, a great partner uh, for the city in this new endeavor. Um, I'm not going to go on too long because Catherine has a lot to share. Uh, about the Brooks and what's going on there as we build our practices and, and welcome the first families who are coming uh, our way. We opened on April 27th, so this is really, really very new still. Um, we will have some time for uh, questions after Catherine's presentation, uh, so please reserve your questions for that uh, time. And there is a chat box somewhere, Chris will probably tell you where, and where you can actually answer your questions. So again, thank you for being with us uh, this afternoon. Catherine, over to you then. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Catherine Mitchell. I'm the Chief Family Transitional Services Officer here at Friendship Place. And I am also the director of the Brooks. Um, just a little bit about me. I'm a licensed independent clinical social worker here in DC. Um, I've been with Friendship Place for coming up on five years. Um, I have previously been um, running the permanent supportive housing program for families. Um, and so I'm excited to transition into um, serving families in, a, in an earlier stage of the um, homeless services continuum and offering um, and leading the team here on site with our short-term family housing program. Uh, so as Jean-Michel said, um, we did open our doors about a month ago to the day. Um, so far we had um, 15 families referred to us and we have um, about 12 families currently on site. Um, but I wanna rewind a little bit and talk a little bit about our process and how we got to where we are today. Um, so as Jean-Michel said, um, the city awarded us the contract in January. And so we had a couple months to um, really build up our program. Um, we got the keys to the building um, just one week before we started. So it was a real whirlwind um, trying to get everything set up. Um, our team on site has been phenomenal. We have our operations team on site as essential staff um, because of course due to um, coronavirus we had to alter our operations even before starting operations to um, promote the, the health and safety of our entire team as well as the families that come through. Um, so we currently are staffed 24 seven with residential aid staff as well as security staff and janitorial staff. Um, we provide support on site um, and connecting with case managers who are currently remote. Um, so we're doing our case management services um, through video chats. Um, we confirm with families that they have the devices required to have the video chats. Um, and if they don't, our, our team on site, we use our laptops or our phones or our tablets to make sure that um, participants can, can still get connected with their case managers. Um, but as Jean-Michel said, the, the, the goal of short-term family housing is to um, move families onward into their own housing within 90 days. Uh, that is a lofty goal. It's a very quick turnaround time. Um, but before coronavirus hit, nearly all of the providers across the city were hitting that benchmark, that 90-day benchmark. That's something that's very closely tracked by the city. 
Um, and actually, we're seeing quite a few exits still happening during coronavirus. So um, despite the pandemic that's going on, uh, our families remain motivated. Our staff across the city continues working to help identify unit, units and move families through the process and move them onward and outward. Um, so what does case management look like? Um, of course, the main goal is housing. Um, obviously, getting families connected through rapid rehousing to find their own housing um, in the community. Um, but housing might look a little bit different based off of the family's needs or interests. Um, so we're also talking about diversion. Is there anywhere else you can go? Is there a family member you can stay with? What other arrangements or supports do families have to offer housing solutions? Um, we're also working with folks on um, getting an idea of what their uh, credit score is, what items are on their credit. So we're actually pulling the reports and walking families through what that looks like and supporting them in making payment plans or um, doing what they need to do to, to begin the process of rebuilding their credit, as we know that is a, a big barrier for some families. Uh, the families that have come through are in varying stages of um, needing IDs or copies of IDs or um, birth certificates and social uh, security cards. And so, of course, those agencies are still in operation, um, just looking a little bit different these days. So we're um, walking our families through how to get their ID, even though DMV services are not in person. Um, how do you request your social security card or, or your birth certificate? Um, if you're out of state or if you're in state, what kind of documentation do you need? So um, we are in close contact with Department of Human Services, who um, helps us communicate with vital records and the DMV and those types of entities just to make sure that we can still walk families through those processes to get those documents that are going to be needed um, when they are moving forward with housing. We're also supporting um, all of the students in our program in connecting with distance learning. Of course, I think this is the last week of school for DC public schools, um, but we're looking forward to um, summer programming um, that DC Public Schools will be offering and making sure families have the technology that they need to um, get connected with schooling. Um, it does seem everybody so far has um, devices and if they don't, we've reached out to uh, DC Equity Fund and we are expecting some devices to be delivered in the coming days just to make sure that all of those families can access what they need. We do have Wi-Fi on site um, so folks can connect that way. Um, we're also talking with families about ways to build their income. You know, 90 days, and especially during a pandemic, it's going to be a little bit tough to get folks um, back into the workforce if that's their goal. Um, but we know that with rapid rehousing, a big focus is increasing income. So we're starting that conversation when they're with us here at the Brooks. So we are working with TANF employment providers. Um, so families that um, receive TANF, which should be all of our families, um, should, may also be connected with a TANF employment provider whose purpose it is is to support that family in getting um, connected to employment or further education opportunities so that they can uh, work towards growing their income. So uh, we have access to the CATCH system so we can see who the provider is and that's the work of the case manager to connect with the TANF employment program. Um, to, to wrap around the family, to eliminate what barriers there are to help families get back into the workforce or work towards um, education or vocational goals. So those are kind of the, the main focus of the work that we're doing with each family. However, of course, our, our services are tailored to the unique and specific needs of each family. Um, so whatever the family is presenting with, whatever they're interested in working on, um, we are supporting families with that, be it getting connected to primary care um, providers, be it getting connected to um, pregnancy resources. We have a handful of expecting mothers who um, can benefit from uh, resources such as the Northwest Pregnancy Center or the Capitol Hill Pregnancy Center. So we're referring to those um, programs and learning how those resources are operating during these times because um, some of the agencies are, are not operating, but others are, and just figuring out what those processes are in this COVID world that we're living in. Um, connecting folks to mental health services if needed or desired, um, things like that. So it's been an, a big learning curve, um, being a brand new program, being a brand new building and all of that. Um, 
we're really grateful for the staff who um, are on site. You know, it's a tough job coming to work every day in a pandemic, um, but everybody has really um, understood the importance of social distancing and wearing masks. We do have all of our families, including the children, wearing masks um, outside of their uh, units. We're taking temperatures when anybody walks in the building. Um, we're asking screening questions about um, new or worsening cough or any fever or if anyone's been around someone who's a known positive. Um, and overwhelmingly, the, the answer has always been no. And there, there haven't been anyone who, who presented with symptoms or any temperatures. So we're, we're grateful and we, we hope that everyone continues to stay healthy and well. Um, being that it is a new building, we've had some challenges with um, the first time pipes are being used or this this door hasn't been opened yet or those types of things. So um, we have a really great um, maintenance team. We have a team of engineers through um, a Department of General Services uh, contractor who's on site with us every day of the week. Or, I'm sorry, Monday through Friday, 9 a.m., 6 a.m. to 9 p.m. Uh, to address any of the challenges that um, come up. And they've been incredibly responsive to make sure that the environment is safe and adequate. Um, for all of our families. Okay. Chris, did you want to? Yeah, I mean, I can start, start shooting some uh, questions. Absolutely, that sounds wonderful. First of all, thank you for all of that, Catherine, and thank you to everyone who's posted questions so far. I'll I'll start going through them, and we can you know either Jean Michel or Catherine or myself can answer them. Uh, the first one uh, speaks about uh, donations and, and items that can be uh, donated. Catherine, can you describe the? donations that are helpful for the people we serve. Um, I'm gonna actually drop a link to our wish list that can, uh, in there and we'll, you, you can find that uh, also on our website. Um, but go ahead, you go ahead and tell us what, what is helpful for the participants. Yes, first I wanna say thank you to everyone who's donated to the Brooks. Um, we are blown away by the support of the community. Truly, it has been remarkable. Uh, we feel confident that despite families having to come into the Brooks and needing to kind of abide by stay at home orders, we have um, a lot of resources and materials that we can provide to families to help pass the time um, in productive ways. So thank you, thank you, thank you to everybody who has donated so far. Um, we've compiled an Amazon wish list um, to organize what um, items we think families would enjoy um, while they're here at the Brooks. So it's a lot of educational games, board games, arts and crafts. Um, we have a lot of books on site that have been donated as well. Um, just anything we could think of that would be best for families. So um, pay attention to the Amazon wish list. We do keep that up and running and as new ideas come or as um, um, interest is expressed, we are putting it directly on the wish list and are so appreciative of, of everyone's generosity. Yeah. And because of the new nature of the building, we're actually look uh, we're actually seeking and accepting new items at this time. Um, I know folks are being so kind and offering things that they may have from their own children uh, because of the new nature of the building and because of the concern about Corona. I know everyone is disinfecting things to be safe. We are actually accepting only new items at this time. Uh, we do actually have programming, other programming for children uh, at other divisions uh, that can possibly make use of. Uh, donated toys. So if you wanted to email me at crutledge at friendshipplace.org, I can point you in the right direction on how to make that happen. So thank you for everyone who's made that offer. Um, I'm going to take us to the next question. Um, so here's a, a what may be a tough question. Uh, how do we think, how do we think that uh, families are going to be able to be out and on their own in three months um, if this has not been the experience about uh, other, sh other shelters in the past? So if you want to talk about the, how the city's three-month expectation is coming to play. Yeah, that's a great question. So that question is probably referring to um, DC General. That was um, a, a very large um, family shelter that the city was uh, running for many years um, that has since closed in favor of opening smaller, more targeted, tailored, service-enriched uh, short-term family housing facilities. And so I think the big difference between the past model and this model is that the emphasis really is on exiting. It's, it's communicated to families even before they set foot in the Brooks that this is expected to be a, a quick transition. And 
we have the way we frame our conversations and the support that we're providing, it's immediate. And um, we are springing into action immediately. So quickly gathering documents, quickly completing um, paperwork to get folks um, enrolled into the rapid rehousing program. All of our uh, families are eligible for rapid rehousing. So we're doing that application within the first week. Um, and they're receiving approval within the first week. So that is a much expedited um, plan than, as I understand, has it, that it's been before. Um, and the way that our programs are structured, being that we only have 50 families on site, we are able, or not even yet, but we will have 50 families on site. Um, it's, a, it's a smaller um, pool of participants that we're working much more closely with than DC General, which had I think 200 families. So that's a that's a massive um, program there. Um, so we have housing navigator on our team, working with our three case managers as well as our social worker, myself, and the case manager supervisor um, to really work together week to week, identifying what's going to be a viable housing option for this family. We're also expecting families to to do their own research. This is very much a collaborative process. Um, but we are building up our, our network um, of landlords who are willing to work with our families. I think everyone on our team actually comes from various aspects of housing services. Um, so many of us are very familiar with landlords who rent to our participants. Many of us are very familiar with the housing process. So I think our experience is really going to help us to be successful. But in the, in the one month that we've been open, um, I would say 80% of our families have a unit identified already. And so it's just a matter of um, going through the process of getting the inspection, the paperwork in place, and signing the lease. Um, so I, I think it's just a, a different, it's just structured differently than um, um, DC General was. Great. Um, next question. Actually, it's a couple of questions from somebody, but I'll break them up, uh, make it uh, a little more manageable here. Um, do each of the families have their own private bathroom? That's a great question. Um, uh, there are two units on each floor. So five residential floors, um, 10 units on each floor. Two units on each floor have their own bathroom. And there are four shared bathrooms in the hallway that two families will share. Great. And what are the open hours for residents? Are They can stay there 24 hours a day? Residents can stay there, stay here 24 hours a day. And in fact, they're encouraged to because it's a stay at home um, order in effect here in DC. Um, so that's a, a different perspective than other um, programs or historically programs have been where you can stay for the night, but you need to leave in the morning. Um, the Brooks is open and available 24 um, seven to our families. Great. And what sort of childcare opportunities do we have while parents may go out looking for employment or housing? So we unfortunately are unable to offer any childcare on site or in house. However, there are resources available in the community um, post COVID. I think we all can understand that coronavirus is certainly impacting our, our daycare and childcare systems. Um, but most families will be eligible for a, what's called a daycare voucher through um, DC Department of Human Services. And so we, we can work with families to apply for that voucher. Um, and that will um, authorize them a certain number of daycare hours per week um, to pursue employment or education or to be employed. Very good. Okay. Next question uh, is a little bit of a tough one. I, I, if Joe Michelle, I may ask you to weigh in on this one along with Catherine. Sometimes the city can be a tough negotiator. And uh, the question is, um, is what the city offering us sufficient for us to do the work we're doing? Or are we tapping our own resources uh, to provide services. So I, uh, just to answer that. <laughs> the the uh, application process uh, and the review process really took about two years. Uh, so we applied for this a couple of years ago. I'm happy to say that the city has been a great partner, not only uh, with the Brooks, but in permanent supportive housing. Um, with the Brooks, we are finding that the city team is extremely well researched. Uh, can provide guidance, which is extremely helpful, has helped us connect with other providers who started before us so we could benefit from their experience. And in terms of the 
uh, funding itself, it's, it, it covers what we need. Um, we're just delighted to see that as community members, you're willing to help us with those little extras that make such a difference in the lives of the families. And these are extras that of course cannot go into a city contract because the city contract has to be approved by the DC Council. And there are only so many things the city council uh, can fund. Um, but I'm happy to say, yes, that the expenses are, are well covered and, and we're not concerned about this contract. But that was a, a good question. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let me take us to the next question. Um, are there age limits on the families, children living at the Brooks, i.e., can adult children live with families as well as minors? So, Catherine? Yeah, um, the answer is yes. There are, there's no age limit. Adult children can live um, in the Brooks with their families. So the um, Virginia Williams Family Resource Center is the central intake point and assessment point for all families seeking housing support in Washington, D.C. So families will, under normal circumstances, present to Virginia Williams, which is on Rhode Island Avenue Northeast, um, but during coronavirus, they are able to complete their assessment over the telephone. Um, and basically, they, they explain their, their family's demographics, they provide um, supporting documents as needed, and then Virginia Williams notifies the Brooks when a family is being referred. And so we're informed how many adults, how many children. Um, the way the Brooks is set up is that um, we can, um, we do have uh, two rooms that adjoin on each floor, so we can have um, a family up to 10 family members um, stay in a, in a two units that are kind of adjoining like a hotel um, having the door in between the in interior of the unit. So we are able to be flexible and accommodating to all different family sizes and structures. But um, we could have families as small as <clears throat> an expecting mother with no minor children yet. Um, or we could have intergenerational families, grandmother, grandchild, great-grandchild, um, the, comp the family composition um, can be whatever the family defines itself as. Great. Um, next question. Again, this is a little tough one. Let me phrase it. Uh, some the the track record for rapid rehousing has been called into question, and sometimes families end up back into homelessness after going through rapid rehousing. What insights might me what we have into this, and how and how it pertains to the folks coming out of uh, the Brooks? Yeah, I think um, there's been a lot of coverage on rapid rehousing over the last few years. I think. It, it can be challenging for families, um, particularly very large family sizes and those types of things. Um, DC is a very expensive city to live in. And um, if you um, need a larger home, um, it, it becomes escalatingly more unaffordable. Um, what is promising though, is that we do have a process in play through the coordinated, um, the CAP system coordinated assessment and housing placement system where as a, a provider system of folks who work in the shelters, folks who work um, in rapid rehousing, folks who work in permanent supportive housing and every step along the way, we get together to case conference. And if there is a case in rapid rehousing, for example, that um, really has higher vulnerabilities um, and would be a candidate for a permanent supportive housing program, um, we can advocate for that. Um, now, of course, um, we would always advocate that more vouchers become available in DC. Um, so if that is something you are passionate about, um, definitely make your voice be heard with um, city council. But um, we, we do know that some families it works beautifully and um, with other families, maybe a higher level of support through a voucher program is needed. Um, and that's just based on um, what's available funding wise. Great. Um, next question is, uh, is there currently a large immigrant population coming through the program? Do we expect there to be a large immigrant population coming through the program? What's the demographics on that? That's a great question. Um, we haven't seen that yet at the Brooks and I actually don't have a lot of data on that um, system wide. Um, so I'll be looking forward to learning about that as well. Great. Okay. So still to be learned. Um, next question. Uh, I'm scrolling down. Uh, what are the volunteer opportunities uh, at this time? And if you want to speak a little bit to that, Catherine and I can jump in. Uh, we go from there. <laughs> sure. Um, we are so appreciative that we've heard a lot of interest of folks wanting to volunteer at the Brooks and we will need you. So 
um, we are we are grateful to hear that there's a lot of interest out there. Of course, due to uh, coronavirus, we are not able to take any volunteers at this time, um, but we are working um, with some other agencies um, like the Homeless Children's Playtime Project to consider bringing them on board um, when it's safe to do so. Um, and they, of course, will need volunteers um, to staff playtime at the Brooks. Um, we are also interested in hosting um, workshops and seminars for our families um, on enriching activities that can help them as they are working towards um, transitioning into their housing. So for example, uh, we have a lot of credit questions since we're pulling credit reports and um, while case managers are very knowledgeable, it could be beneficial to have financial experts or folks who know about credit repair to come in and support our team and, and helping um, our families in navigating that process. Um, things such as um, parenting classes or wellness workshops or um, just whatever topics might be of interest to our families, we're definitely interested in um, bringing into the facility and offering here um, when it is safe to have external volunteers on site. We're also looking for folks to do fun stuff like game night or movie night or um, birthday parties or um, those types of fun activities. Once it's safe to do so, um, we, the, the possibilities are endless and we are really looking forward to the creativity and the support of the community to help us offer a lot of enriching activities here at the Brooks. And so you definitely reach out to Catherine or myself or Chris Kennedy and we coordinate accordingly. So thank you. Um, uh, next question one, uh, you know, so much, you know, sometimes we in the field get to talk in acronyms. Could you explain what TANF is? <laughs> yes, TANF, T-A-N-F is Temporary Assistance for Needy Families. So it's a, it's a monthly payment that is used to support families in um, caring for their children, buying clothes and those types of things. Thanks. Um, and to confirm the res, I'm, going, I'm reading through the questions here, residents are eligible for the HUD DC voucher section eight programs upon departure. Correct. So they could be eligible, but I think the question is availability. So what they're leaving, when they're moving into their housing, um, through the support of the Brooks staff, they have the rapid rehousing subsidy. And that subsidy stays with them for up to 12, for 12 months. Um, and then after that, if they um, get stepped up to a voucher program, then they'll transition to that type of funding. Or if they apply for a Section 8 program and are accepted, then they could transition into Section 8. Great. What is the barrier uh, level to entry? What do families need to be able to show in terms of need to enter the books? Yeah, that's a great question. So they need to show that they are DC residents. Um, so folks coming from Virginia or Maryland have a, um, they need to establish residency in DC before they can be eligible for the Brooks. And they need to be a family. So that means either one, at least one minor child or a woman in um, at least six months pregnant. Great. Um, and must be experiencing homelessness. If they have somewhere they can stay that night, then the city does not consider them to be literally homeless. Very good, thank you. Um, how are children going to be transported to their schools and which schools will they be going to? So most of the children who um, will come to the Brooks, well, let, let me back up. The family has the choice to decide where to enroll their child. So if the child is enrolled at a school outside of Ward 3 and the family wants to continue having their child be, being enrolled in that, that school, um, then they can. And so it would be up to the family to make sure that they get their child to school each day. Um, the family could choose to enroll. Uh, oh, hold on once. Anne, I think, I don't know what, Anne, I think you're sharing content here. <laughs> See if I, but you go on, Catherine, I will stop. <laughs> um, so if, if families decide to enroll um, their student in the, the in-boundary school, uh, they would have the right to do so. So that would be um, Eaton Elementary, for example. Um, but overwhelmingly, we've heard from other providers that most families um, keep their student in the school that they were originally enrolled in before coming to the Brooks. Very good. Thank you. Sorry for that interruption there. Um, are there any adverse aspects to being next door to the police department? 
an, a very interesting question. I None that we've seen so far. We had a meeting with Commander Bedlian a couple weeks ago just to introduce ourselves um, and explain what we're doing here um, and, and finding ways that we can collaborate. I've heard from other sites, and this is something we're very interested in doing is kind of um, once it's safe to do so, bringing in um, some of the officers for community night just to put um, faces to names and um, open up dialogue between residents of the Brooks and uh, the police. We don't see them as adversaries. We see them as on our team. We're all working together to support DC residents. Um, and, you know, we want to make sure that we have a good working relationship and that our residents are, feel comfortable with the police too. Um, they're there to help keep them safe as well. Very good. Um, how many families are there right now? We have 12. Very good. Um, we talked about games, uh, books, etc. Do you have space to store all of these items for the time being? We do have um, a fairly, fairly ample amount of, of storage space, which I was pleased to see. Um, I have yet to see bookshelves, though, so that's a, a we're still waiting. We're still a work in progress with the city, but um, we have um, a few storage closets on each floor, which has been super helpful for the generous donations that we've received so far. One thing I will say is that in the rooms. There, you know, the, the rooms are only so big, so families um, may or may not have a lot of space in their units, just depending on the family size and, and what uh, unit they're um, occupying. Um, so any donation that we provide to families would have to be kind of something that is easily tucked away or, or stored, nothing too large. Very good. Um, someone had requested that we post the the wish list i've dropped it uh, once or twice into the chat here um and it should be clickable it looked to me like it was clickable through the chat if you wanted to click through there and open that link up um i also want to say thank you bill hoffman mentioned that child's play on connecticut avenue is putting together toys etc starting from that wish list if people wish to shop locally um so i'm not sure um bill if you want to mention later on in the chat how people contact child's play about that that's a lovely thing to do. Uh, I think we're, let me stop this video one more time. I think Anne has accidentally uh, jumping into video here. How do I make this stop here? Anne Morrison, I think you're accidentally starting your video here. I'm trying to undo that here. Uh, anyway. One thing I'll also say on the subject of um, donations and way to support um, the team here, um, we are working with families who have specific requests or needs um, to develop a sign-up genius as well. So um, that is not launched yet, but it's on our, its way um, where we will have our case managers speaking directly with families to add um, specific wishes. For example, um, we have some expecting mothers who may be in need of baby supplies. We have um, some families who've identified that new shoes for their kids or, or clothes um, for their kids will be needed. So. Um, stay tuned for that, and um, hopefully Chris will be able to blast it when it is ready in the next, um, hopefully, week or two um, to those who are interested in supporting. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, one observation, you know, you know, well, actually, it's a question. I'm sorry. Are we expecting a large influx of people who have lost their jobs and homes because of the pandemic? That's a really great question, and what I've heard from um, Department of Human Services, who contracts with us to provide. Um, so that we can operate the Brooks is that the, the city is ramping up to um, expect more folks experiencing homelessness or housing instability um, as um, COVID wraps up um, as a re result of losing jobs or the financial crisis that's been going on. So um, the city is still opening other short-term family housing sites. Um, the Ward 6 site, I think, is coming online um, in the next week or two, and then the Ward 1 site is next. So. We are expecting that we will um, all be reaching our capacities down the line. Uh, but the city is also ramping up um, emergency rental assistance um, services, as well as um, di uh, homeless prevention programs and resources to those programs. So um, there's, a, there's a, a number of different programs to serve families in varying stages of housing instability or, or homelessness, and it looks like the city is getting ready for um, more families in need of accessing those services. All right. Um, just so uh, folks know, if you look in the chat, I've just dropped in the link for Child's Play as well. So thank you. Um, I forget now who sent that, but thank you to whoever did send that. I dropped that into the chat. Uh, next question is, um, are the referrals only for rapid rehousing, or is it possible to get permanent supportive housing referrals as well? 
the vast majority are going to be rapid rehousing because we know that when folks come to us that everybody is eligible for that. Um, it, it, depending on the family circumstances, how long they've been in, in the system, if they're a transfer from another program, if they've already been connected to a voucher, um, they might have a voucher. So there's a handful of folks we're working with who do have vouchers just based on their circumstances. Um, I think if someone is brand new to um, the homeless services system in DC, this is their first time calling Virginia Williams, it's their first time in shelter, um, it's, it's highly unlikely that they would immediately receive a voucher. They're gonna start with rapid rehousing first. Great. Uh, let me scroll to the next question. Is the Brooks just for mothers and children or also fathers? Also fathers. Um, so it's not just women and children. We have two parent households. If we had a single father with kids, he would be eligible. Um, whatever the family composition looks like, we're happy to um, welcome them here. Very good. Um, we talked a bit about what, what is necessary as people are coming into the Brooks. Uh, we have a follow-up question. What about donations for things for residents as they leave the Brooks? That's a great question. So we have set up the, I believe it's called the Neighbor to Neighbor Fund. Um, that allows us um, as families are exiting into their own housing, our, our staff will actually be able to take each family on a shopping trip to um, purchase their own um, the items that they need for their home. So linens, uh, cooking supplies, uh, towels, those types of things. Um, they, through the generosity of um, the supporters of Friendship Place, we are, are very pleased to be able to offer that to each family that exits. And I've just dropped into the chat the link to the Neighbors to Neighbors Fund. There we go. Um, let me scroll to the next question. Someone asked about a recap on volunteer opportunities. Again, um, you know, things like teaching class, fun classes, other enrichment activities. If you have any ideas, reach out to Catherine or myself or Chris Kennedy, and we'll be able to talk to you in more detail. Um, next question. How does a family show DC residents? A really good question and that is something that Virginia Williams handles um, so once they come to us and they are approved and eligible for services we just take it from there um, but they would need to likely receive their any benefits that they receive in DC so if they receive TANF if they receive if they have health insurance through Medicaid or any other source um, those would need to be through DC systems, not Maryland, not Virginia, not another jurisdiction. Um, it's not a requirement, of course, that folks have IDs. Um, you, that's something that we work on with families once they're here. So that wouldn't be what we're looking for in terms of proving residency. It would be, are they receiving benefits here? Do they, have they established that they have been um, in DC either accessing shelter resources or their kids are enrolled in school here or what other, whatever other supporting ways to, to identify that they're a DC resident. Very good. Well, the next two uh, comments in the chat are actually co uh, congratulations. So I'm going to embarrass you, Kat. <laughs> uh, one person noting how impressed she is with you and the work that you're doing, and another one saying that uh, this is going to be a model for cities across the globe. So thank you for all of your work, Catherine, and thank you for your kind words. Um, <laughs> scrolling through. Oh, here we go. Here's the next question. Will the city be flexible on the 90-day rule in light of current circumstances? Thank you for asking that question. Um, they, the city is understanding. And in fact, the city, um, the deputy administrator for uh, family homeless services, Noah Abraham, Abraham has said that our main priority is making sure that families are, are safe and well. That's the first thing we're worried about right now during this pandemic. Now, what we have seen is that a lot of families are super motivated because um, a, a shelter setting isn't the most ideal when we're in a pandemic. And so we're, we are seeing that families are very motivated and working very, very hard um, to exit to housing. So I, I think the city is understanding, the city is still tracking um, how much time families spend in short-term family housing so that those numbers won't be forgiven, so to speak. But um, of course the city understands that there's a lot more going on here um, that is, is has been a little bit more difficult to navigate, but actually we have seen quite a few exits during this time. Fantastic. Um, we had a follow-up question about how, how will, I know the parents will be responsible for transporting kids to their homeschool. Do we have a sense as to how they're going to be able to do that? 
Yeah, that's a great question. And that's something that um, through the support of our generous supporters, we will be able to support families with in terms of providing, there is a um, transportation pilot that's been um, put into place, or at least it was for last semester, um, where families were provided with a smart trip card um, because of course children can navigate the public transit system for free through the DC one card, but not their parents. And so we wanna make sure parents are taking their young children to school. Um, and so there was a pilot program uh, to offer smart trips for uh, parents. But that being said, that is one of the foreseeable gaps that we see for families. Um, Ward three may be very, very far away from where their child goes to school. And so we've identified that as a need. And again, based on the support of the community, we should be able to provide families with smart trips um, or even Uber or Lyft um, credits to try to get their kids across town, wherever their school might be, um, so that they we can prioritize that children are attending school each day and on time. Great. So do we project whether we, we either currently have or will have a need for ESL services? That is a great question. Um, we do have two bilingual case managers on our team, which is great. Um, so we can expect that we'll have some um, folks who English is not their first language. Um, we do have access to the city um, language access line, of course, to interact with the head of household, but there may be a need for uh, some English tutoring or ESL support down the line. I think that's that's highly possible. So let's get your name and we will sign you <laughs> up if that need comes up. <laughs> You've stepped forward, whether you're not. That's great. Thank you. Um, qu another question here. Do we assist residents with money management and budgeting skills? Yes, definitely. Um, that's going to be a huge part of somebody's ability to um, maintain their housing. Of course, it's growing their income, but also managing uh, their, their budget appropriately. So that is conversation that we're having. Um, if we have any budgeting experts out there, we'd love to bring you in to talk to our, our families here. Um, budgeting is, is a big, big, big part of, of keeping um, keeping housed once you're housed. Right. Will the neighbor to neighbor fund uh, provide only new goods to residents or can kitchen goods, et cetera, be donated? It's a good question. Um, when we talk about that, that's where we get into a little bit of the space challenges. And we've also found that it's really empowering and a good experience for families to be able to select their own items, like when they go shopping um, with our case managers. So we found that that has been um, a really positive experience. Uh, but I think once we are at capacity and see how our um, storage capacity is in the building, um, we might consider um, having some of those resources stored on site. I just know when we're talking about, um, uh, you know, eventually a five to 10 exits per month, um, that would be quite a lot of materials to keep on site here. Very good. How are residents uh, going to manage or how are they managing the transportation links uh, from the Brooks to the Metro? How, how are they making that connection? Yeah, that's a good question. I think we're seeing a lot of Lyft and Uber use. Um, folks are taking the bus. Um, I'm not sure if folks are taking the Metro. That's a, that's a great question. I think with movement so limited because of the pandemic, I, you know, it's, it's hard to say what um, movement will look like once we're kind of reopened and, and resuming kind of a normal day-to-day -day process. Very good. Um, what sort of response has there been from neighbors since you've opened? For the most part, it's been very, very positive. Um, we have heard a lot of great things from neighbors. If I'm out and about, neighbors sometimes, you know, pull me over and, and are very interested in what's happening here. So we're, we are appreciative of that. We have heard a few concerns raised from neighbors that we are looking into. Um, but I think one thing that would be helpful um, is to remind the community that uh, the folks, the residents at the Brooks are also residents of this community. Um, and we wanna make sure that their privacy is being respected and that they in themselves are being respected. Um, I, I think that would be something very important to remind some of the neighbors. <laughs> um, I've reached the end of the questions in the chat room. Um, 
I am willing to try uh, unmuting folks if people want to pose a question, but I do recognize that runs the risk of having 40 people ask a question at once. But let's give this a whirl here. Unmute all. Okay, Everyone is unmuted, so please be, be aware you're all unmuted. Um, anybody want to ask a question uh, as we proceed? Raise your hand. Maybe. Here. Oh. Nope. Okay, I'm good. Uh, I'm hearing a lot of din here. So I'm going to uh, I'm going to mute everybody and just unmute Catherine again. I just didn't. Uh, it just gets very loud and want everyone to be able to hear. Um, well, we have about ten minutes left here, so if anyone wants to put any other questions in the chat room, we certainly can. Uh, in the meanwhile, let me ask Catherine a question. I mean, what, what would be the number one takeaway you would like the community to know about the people we're serving from the books? What's the most important thing for, for people to be aware of. Really good question, Chris. Um, I think every family has their own unique circumstances. Um, I think it's really important um, to to be empathetic and understanding of, of the families who may or may not have um, spent a lot of time in Ward Three. Um, they might be in a new, a new environment to them. They're definitely in a new environment being at the Brooks. And so that can be um, a tough shakeup in the family's day-to-day -day routine. Um, and so I, and I think everybody has, for the most part, been extremely respectful and um, warm, <clears throat> excuse me, and welcoming uh, to the families. And I think, um, I, I think, Families are, they're just trying to do their best just like the rest of us are. And I think especially um, being in a, in a program like this during a pandemic is, is a, can be a tough situation for families. So um, I think extra understanding and grace and, and support from afar uh, is, is the best we can ask for at this point. Um, but the families are, are super grateful for what we have been able to offer them through the generous support of the community. So. They know, they feel your support. They, they um, are appreciative of what we are able to um, offer them through what everybody has contributed to the Brooks. Have any of them come to you specifically and said something that's been particularly heartwarming so far? Yeah, I think, um, you know, through the welcome baskets, through the friends and neighbors of the Brooks, um, they, they just thought that was so lovely. So we are able to offer a welcome basket that has toiletries and gift certificates and those types of things um, as they come in. Um, and then we've also had another generous donor who um, donated some funds. So we were able to provide Visa gift cards to everybody. And I think it's really great that we have um, a lot of resources on hand so we can provide specific items to folks when they need it. But what's really special to the families is being able to identify what they would like for themselves and have the flexibility of a gift card to be able to um, purchase those items on their own. Um, so I think that is something that we're very pleased to be able to offer because um, it'll help families kind of fill their own gaps um, based on the, the preferred items that they're looking for. Um, okay. I think, yeah, the, 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 neighbor, the neighbors have been very thoughtful and kind and extremely generous. I can't say it enough. So we, we are very, very grateful to be a part of Ward 3. Fantastic. Um, one question, a late question that just came in. Um, what do families do for breakfast, lunch, and dinner? That's a great question, and I overlooked that in my presentation. So we do offer um, breakfast and dinner, and we will 365 days a year. Um, during this uh, pandemic, we are offering lunch, and during summertime, we'll, we will be able to offer lunch to families as well. So we have a... Uh, a food vendor, um, Henry Soul Cafe, who delivers uh, meals to us on a daily basis that we provide to families. Um, during coronavirus, our dining room is closed. Um, so we are offering box meals and delivering it up to families in their units. Is it tough on the families to be in the rooms and not to be able to come out to other parts of the facility? I, I think it has been tough, just like it's been tough for a lot of us to stay at home. Um, those who have children can definitely relate. Um, so, and we have a beautiful state-of-the-art playground that unfortunately is closed. Um, and so it, it has been tough on families, um, families in all circumstances, but especially at the Brooks, I think um, that's, that's been challenging. So families are 
going on walks. Families are um, taking care of errands in the community, um, but for the most part, um, we've been encouraging families to abide by the stay at home order. But, and when they do go out, are they, um, how, how, how has it been in terms of the uh, masks and gloves matter and, and people wearing those out in the community or it, within the Brooks itself? Yeah, so we provide masks, um, thanks to, again, generous donations from the community. We have cloth masks. We also have um, KN95 masks and surgical masks. So we are, we are stocked with masks and able to provide them to every staff member, every resident, um, adult or child. Um, and we are constantly reminding folks um, to wear their masks. But most folks are very much abiding by that. Um, you know, it's sometimes it's a reminder for me to wear my mask too. But um, you know, it's, we're all learning of this new normal, and for the most part, families have been very, very receptive and understanding. Great. Um, how has the uh, Wi-Fi connectivity for school been by remote? Is it the kids have been able to keep up with the the work thus far? Yeah, I think I think it it varies based on each family and and their circumstances and what's been going on. Um, we are hiring for a youth specialist um, who we hope to bring on very, very soon who can really connect with the families more in depth on this issue and making sure that children have what they need. Um, but we know that distance learning is tough, period. Um, and we want to do our best to support families with that as, the best, as best as we can. So case managers are talking with families about it. Um, I think it's, it's varying results, but with that youth specialist, hopefully we can dig into that matter a little bit more with families as we prepare for summer school and um, next fall if this continues. Great. Well, we're coming up on the one o'clock hour here and I wanna respect everyone's time. So I think I'm gonna pose one more question to Catherine and then ask Jean Michel to do some closing, clothing. Um, closing, yeah. Well, uh, Catherine, what's, been, what's your favorite part of the day? That's a good question. I, my office is located right next to the security desk. So I see everybody every single day. Um, and that's been really cute. And it's all windows too. So I got to wave to everybody and the little kids come up and knock on my door. Um, so it's, it's really nice. And to me, that states that we are, that speaks to the, the comfortable, friendly, welcoming environment that we are creating here. Um, we've heard a lot of feedback from families as they come in that um, the environment is really positive. Everyone is professional. I'm treated with respect. And, and that's really important to Friendship Place um, because that's who we are and what we believe in. But especially um, we know folks are coming from circumstances where that may not have been the case. And so we are, are pleased to kind of offer a new facet to um, short-term family housing, to homeless services. Um, and that's something that we've always done for 30 years since since we opened our welcome center. Um, but to me, it's been effective and it's working um, despite the challenging circumstances and being greeted with people wearing masks all the time, not really being able to see people smile, that, that warmth and that friendliness and that professionalism is still um, um, reaching the families. And so to me, that, that speaks to our team is doing a phenomenal job um, and people are, are feeling like it's a comfortable environment to be in for the time being. Fantastic. Catherine, we know you've got so much going on, so much every day. So thank you for taking an hour out of your day to talk to everyone here and uh, to answer questions and to share about the work that we're doing and how profoundly impactful this is going to be on so many lives. So thank you for everything you do, but particularly thank you for the past hour here. Jean-Michel, I'm going to turn it over to you for any closing comments you'd like. Yes, well, I would like to thank you, Catherine, for a great presentation and for your leadership at the Brooks. Uh, I'm very much inspired by what you're doing with the team. Uh, opening a short-term facility for families during COVID is just an incredible challenge, and the team is really up to it. Um, to everybody on the call, uh, thank you for your interest. I think we peaked at 70 participants, which is really, really great. I want to thank you for your support of Friendship Place uh, through the years. We could never do this without you. And Friendship Place is a true community-based organization. So we are a very inclusive community and, and we appreciate your help, uh, your ideas also. Uh, a lot of uh, thought has come into building this programming at the Brooks, as you can tell. It's very person-centric, empowering, solutions-based. 
all the pieces that we like to see in this programming, and you have a role in that as community members, you help us. Um, we're connected to and actually co-facilitating the neighborhood advisory team with Catherine. We'll be uh, talking to these uh, folks tomorrow, so just a little bit more about, you know, the support and accountability uh, on our part to the uh, community. Uh, this is a group that just monitors the conditions around the facility and tries to improve community relations. So we'll be talking to these folks tomorrow. Um, I'm sure we'll have another opportunity soon to have a call about the Brooks. Um, and we'll let you know how far we've gotten with uh, the programming at that stage. Uh, Chris, thank you for facilitating the call so well this afternoon. And again, thank you so much for supporting us to all of you. Uh, keep your support coming. Take care. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Jean-Michel. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you, everyone, for joining. And everyone has a great uh, week. Take care. I'm going to end the recording now. <laughs>